All right, so looking at dinosaurs again in God's Word, and again, so now we've covered all these different things. We saw that dinosaurs are the dragons of the Bible, and they were made on day six with man, and that we do have evidence of them living with people. So the big question is, what happened? What ended up happening? I forgot to switch out my notes to the dinosaurs. Hey, somebody remembered. <laughs> no. So, again, if we have all this evidence for them, again, the question that both creationists and evolutionists always try to answer, again, what happened to them? Like I said, the answer is pretty simple. They died. Dinosaurs died, whatnot. And I was told last night I have to put this picture up here by my significant other. So... This is at the Creation Museum. It's an Allosaurus. It's the most complete fossil of an Allosaurus in the world. It was donated to the Creation Museum. The head is actually a replica because it's too heavy to sit there. They actually have the head in a case separated off to the side. But that is just a replica. That way they could have it there on that. They, again, it would just be too heavy to sit there and balance with everything else. So the question is not what happened to the dinosaurs. The question is, why are they no longer here? And again, what happened as far as what caused them to die, right? So why? Why are they dead? The craziest thing is, is that both creationists and evolutionists both have pretty much the same basic theory as to what happened to the dinosaurs, as to why they all ended up dying. And that is basically climate change. They're like, climate change? Oh, no, Kevin, I can't believe you're one of those. Now, all right, hold on. They're not talking about the crazy man-made climate change and stuff that everybody's wanting to try to say happens, whatnot, everything. Climate change, again, we're not talking about man-made climate change. Climates do change. The world's weather changes constantly. Everybody's like, climate change? Yes, it does, all the time. From year to year, we have different weather patterns all the time, and they do change. Well, it's a lot hotter than the average and stuff. Well, you know what an average is? If we take all of the numbers, you add them together, and then divide it by the set list of numbers you have, well, the amount of numbers you have. That's an average. So guess what? You have an average. It's kind of right there in the middle, but you have extremes on either end. So if it's above or below average temperature, that is really not telling you anything other than, hey, guess what? You have an extreme or uh, one way or the other that's deviating from what the average is. Again, all these numbers help to make the average. And so that's one thing I just do not really, again, get from a lot of people and say, well, it's, uh, the temperature is way above average this year. It's like, well, it's never on the average at all. The average, again, adds up to all of them. If it's right on the nose, and that's an anomaly. So, again, do cli does climate change actually happen? Yes, it does. Again, it's been changing for years. Let me ask you this. Are the ice caps melting? Yeah, they're melting. Why are the ice caps melting? Guess what? They're in water. What happens when you put a piece of ice in water? It melts. All right, So, but we not only have water, we have salt water. So what happens when you put ice in salt water? It melts faster, right? So, again, you end up not having a lot of the things going on there. So, again, yes, they're melting, but when you're getting hit by salt water all the time, of course it's going to melt. It happens. Also, the sea level is rising. It's been rising for millennia. These things have been happening for a long time. Why do we know the sea level has been rising? Well, because there are cities that were once on the coastline that are now underwater, there are ancient cities that used to be, you know, above ground, unless they could swim and hold their breath really well. They are above ground, above water on the ground on the coastline, and over the years, what the sea level rose and now it's underwater. So yes, some of these things are happening, but not to the extreme that everybody's trying to make. Again, whatnot. As I said, we got things are under water now, but again. Warming and cooling trends have been seen throughout the world for the last thousand years. Historians, people writing eyewitness accounts of their times and stuff, 
talk about, oh, it's been, you know, we've had this warming trend for, you know, the last 100 years or better, where it's been really, really hot. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, it gets really, really cold. Again, around the 1600s, 1700s, there was a really, what they call the Little Ice Age, where it cooled off a lot and everything. And everybody was kind of freaking out because it got a lot cooler. But then what? Now it's warming back up again. Around the year 1000, they had a massive warming uh, trend in Europe, so much so that it actually thawed out Scandinavia. And that's one of the reasons why the Vikings stopped attacking the southern parts of Europe and everything, into England and France. So they stopped because now they can actually farm their land. It wasn't just a big block of ice, or ice dirt and everything. So I thought them out a little bit. So again, these trends end up coming and going. It's nothing that we've ever done. People don't do that. It's just part of the way the world works. And the reason why we have this fluctuation in the weather and stuff can be attributed back to one major event in Genesis. And is there uh, somebody, a child or somebody, can tell me what this major event would end up causing a lot of change in weather pattern? Well, Marty, you know what it will be? Big event in Genesis, they change weather, has a lot of water. Yeah, what? Oh, Lucas, can you have him out? Right, the flooding. So, who built the boat on the flood? Noah. Noah. All right. So, Noah, yeah. Well, Mark, grab, grab your prize. Yeah, you, you're a good sport over there. But, yeah, so the weather changes and stuff, again, end up, end up being caused by the flood. So, the reason why we have all these fluctuations of weather is because of the flood. And the earth does not look like it did at the time of creation. So the question ends up being, what was the pre-flood world like? And why were these giant beasts able to live at this point, but all of a sudden they start dying off more afterwards? Well, let's look and see what the world was like a little bit. So in Genesis chapter 1, and you see, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in, unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit at whose seed is in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and evening and morning were the third day. So when God ends up making the earth, again, it does not look like the earth today. In fact, whenever he created the earth, he made dry land to appear. And he gathered all the waters together into what are seas and stuff. So the earth would have looked a little bit more like this, where there's a lot more dry land than there would have been water. You did have big bodies of water around and stuff, but nothing like the oceans we see today. It would have been mostly dry land over the earth with vegetation so the problem is also that yes while the earth did look different these ideas of supercontinents and of course the most notable being Pangaea and everything which is right here and those were not actually real again and one thing I disagree with answers in Genesis on they actually argue about some of these supercontinents and that the continents moved away from each other and this and that but from all the evidence that I've seen and whatnot, again, these are just simply not real, not true. Again, it makes more sense that the earth was all, again, they're dry, there's small bodies of water and whatnot. And the reason why I don't believe that, you know, continents can just sit there and move from one side of the globe to the other, um, if you pulled all the water off of the planet, what would you find underneath the water? Dirt. Mm -hmm. I right, guess what? It's all still connected. All the dirt, all the, you know, the crust of the earth is all still connected, even though now it has a lot of cracks in it. But again, there is, it is still connected. 
And so things don't just float across the water as you know, it makes it appear to be. Of course, they don't say that it floats across the water, but they have other reasonings behind it. But again, it just really doesn't make any real sense. So, again, Pangea and stuff like that, again, just trying to show the attempts of secularists to try to say there's billions of worth of change on the planet in those regards. But also when God made everything, there were actually no mountains either. The big mountains that we see today would not have existed. The reason why we know this is because of the account of the flood. So Genesis 7:20 states that when the flood came up, it went up 15 cubits. So 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. Well, Kevin, it says mountains right there. Well, let me ask you this. If you have a relatively flat area and then all of a sudden you have this area that kind of goes up, would that be, that could be a mountain, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be super huge. 15 cubits is not actually very tall. It's only about 22 and a half feet. So the water was tall enough to cover the mountains. Then the mountains had to be less than 22 and a half feet. And really they had to be quite a bit shorter because if you're going to drown a bunch of people and they can go up just 20 feet and live, then there's going to be something wrong. So these, the elevation had to have been no greater than probably about 15 feet in order for that to make it to where people would end up dying. So again, these mountains here are not like the mountains that we see today. They're probably more like small hills that people are able to get to and everything. So God ends up causing all the water, again, as we said, to be gathered into seas as we look at the earth as it was when God made it. And again, these, as I said a while ago, are not the oceans that we have today. Again, a lot of people suggest that the new earth that God is going to create at the end of time is going to look a lot like the original creation. And we can look in Revelation and we can see what it says about what the new earth is going to look like. So Revelation 21.1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So I guess there's no more oceans and whatnot. So there's no more sea whatsoever. It's all pretty much dry land on the earth at this point. So again, a lot of people argue that this was the way it was in God's original creation, that the oceans were not there and everything. We just had large lakes like this one right here. So this is actually uh, the Caspian Sea in, uh, between Europe and Asia. It's a pretty big body of water. But there you also have the Great Lakes. Again, you'd end up having big bodies of water like this. You mean you have these giant wells and stuff like that swimming around in these bodies of water? Only this big? Yeah. Man, they don't really need that much room to move. Everything. All the fish, all the marine life would have been in various lakes about yay big. And seas about that big right there. So... One thing also about the water is that, again, there actually had water underneath the crust of the earth as well, and we actually still see this today. When God, again, separated everything out, not only put it in these little, you know, big lakes and stuff and everything, he also put water underneath the crust of the earth. And we know this occurs because we still have water underneath the ground today through aquifers and stuff like that that we find. And this is where most of the water from the flood actually came from, was from the ground. Again, it did not rain before the flood. There are actually no clouds in the sky before the flood. Because if there are clouds, then you'd end up getting what? Rain. So if there's no rain, there can be no clouds. And therefore, have you ever seen a cloudless day? I mean... And, you know, we have some every now and then where you have maybe just a hint of one or two there, but mostly it's clear. But, yeah, having every day where there's no cloud in the sky, it'd be interesting. The closest thing I can imagine to that would be on September 11, 2001, when all the planes were not in the air and you didn't have the vapor trails and stuff in the air. That was really weird. 
never not seeing those. But how do we know that the water came out of the ground? Well, the Bible tells us. In Genesis 7, 11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So God, from what I gather, and there are different theories about how God caused the flood and this and that, but the one I find the best is that God caused basically an earthquake to form, and it cracked open the crust, and everything in the water shot up out of the ground. And it shot so high in the ground and whatnot, eventually came back down as rain as well. So if you actually look through the account as well, you also end up seeing that after the rain stopped, the water kept rising. Forty days, forty nights, the water kept, or it rained, but then the water kept rising for 150 days. So how can it keep rising if it's no rain? Well, it's coming out of the ground and keep making it go higher and higher and higher. And the Bible also speaks in other places, again, of water being under the earth. Psalm 24, 1 and 2, a Psalm of David, the earth, is a, or sorry, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he that founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So again, the earth was founded upon the seas, established upon the floods. There's water again, the earth that has water underneath it. Psalm 33, 7, He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. So again, he lays up the depth in storehouses. Put a bunch of water in places to stay stored up for later dates. Psalm 136, 6, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. So again, God ends up putting water underneath the crust of the earth. And a lot of people think that there was a whole lot more. Of course, all the water, most of the water we see now on top used to be underneath. And they think they acted kind of like a cushion a little bit more to keep earthquakes and stuff from actually happening the way they do today as well in many regards. So we do have the empirical proof that, again, you can just drill down today and find water underneath the earth today. So on day three, God also ends up creating all the plant life and everything. And if you have it mostly land and everything, with just big giant lakes and stuff and not oceans, everything, the world is going to be a lot more tropical and it'll look a lot more like forests and stuff. And we actually find evidence, we have the same evidence that the evolutionists do, that the earth was at one time a more tropical place. It was more humid and it was warmer than it is now. God help them all. Because we live in southeast Missouri, we all know about humidity, right? But it was tropical and it was humid. And again, so we actually find evidence for this throughout. Here we actually see a fossilized palm leaf that had been found in the Mela. Malaspina uh, Glacier in Yucatan. Yucatan is in Canada. So, or Yucatan, yeah, Yucatan is in Canada. And so they actually in northern Canada, where now it's all tundra and stuff. They've actually found evidence of tropical palm leaves found in fossils up there. In Alaska, fossils of several palms, Burmese lacquer trees, mangroves, and trees that produce nutmeg and Madagascar, uh, Macassar oil have all been found on the eastern gulf of Alaska. So you find all these tropical trees and vegetation in northern parts where they should not be. By modern standards, these trees and plants should not be there because they will not survive in that cold area. So how did they get there? They are there, you know, before it used to be warmer there. They also have a fossilized tropical forest that is in Norway. So in Norway, they've actually discovered an entire tropical fossilized forest in the northern parts of their country. Again, would not survive today. But way back in the day, it was able to survive pre-flood. 
He also had fossilized wood, pollen, ferns, mosses, ginkgos, and flowering plants that had been found in mudstone and sandstone in Antarctica. So they found all sorts of various plants and stuff in Antarctica that has been fossilized. Again, it shows that Antarctica it used to be a lot warmer than what it is today. And mudstone and sandstone. Anybody know how you get mudstone and sandstone? It's all made by large amounts of water. It's made by large amounts of water. So again, the earth was quite a bit different than it is today. It is quite a bit different. It is Now again, secular scientists all claim that these places were in different locations of the planet and they ended up moving to these locations after millions of years. And the sad thing is that creationists who argue that Pangea and stuff like that were real and the continents split and everything, they kind of had the same arguments, but they claimed that it happened at the flood when the continents shifted and moved to where they are today. And again, it just doesn't make a lot of logical sense for that. And why are you going to side with you know people and the basics of the idea when there's no real proof that it's happening? And, of course, a lot of people like to argue about the Horn of Africa. Well, it's splitting apart from Africa and everything and whatnot. Yeah, the Great Rift Valley. And the, well, yeah, the tectonic plates are separating and it's filling with water. But guess what? More land, if we're for it to fill water, guess what has to happen? You have to have more land underneath there for it to hold the water. If it's completely ripping apart, then you're not actually, you know going to have water standing there in those lakes that they have there in the Great Rift Valley. And so it's not actually ripping apart. It is, you know, the tectonic plate is pulling, but you have magma and stuff, lava coming up and making new land and separating it out. It's just lower than where it is. So it's still connected, but it's just making a big dip where, you, where they used to be a little bit connected by the tectonic plate there. So also in Antarctica, scientists have recently discovered that under two kilometers of ice in Antarctica, you have valleys and rolling hills and riverbeds. At one time, Antarctica actually used to be a pretty nice place in that part of the globe. They've even also found fossilized dinosaurs in Antarctica. And so how would they be able to survive the cold? They, they wore their parka. So... One thing we know about the earth as well, when God first made it, is that it actually had more oxygen in the atmosphere than what it does today. Air bubbles that have been found in amber or fossilized tree sap show oxygen levels at 35% instead of today's 21%. This is just about a 50% increase in, in oxygen levels. So you have about a 50% increase in how much more oxygen was in the earth during this time when God first made it. And we think it's good to breathe now. You imagine breathing 35% oxygen in the air. You don't have to go to the mall to get those little oxygen, you know, things and whatnot. And whatnot, you can just breathe and feel better and everything. And again, a lot of other things were probably just a little bit different as well in the pre-flood world. But also more oxygen means animals can get bigger. Things usually get bigger as well and whatnot. And there is a lot of evidence for larger animals. In fact, we found evidence there, thing that there was a centipede that's about as big as a truck. And it's, it's pretty crazy. At the Creation Museum, they have a replica of a fossil of a dragonfly that's uh, three, four times bigger than my hand. I actually got a picture of my hand next to it. Everything is very large. So animals did used to be a lot bigger as well. So what happened? How did the earth change? Well, again, God flooded the earth because of man's sin. And things changed. It's not just going to be a consequence against man and people, but the whole earth is going to be affected by this. And that only makes sense. If you have a global flood, that is going to cause global consequences for the earth. So again, the main theory I like, or that I like, is kind of an adaptation of the hydroplate theory of how God ended up doing this. So I kind of went through it a little bit, but we're going to briefly go through it again. 
So again, like I said, there's a layer of water under the crust of the earth. Again, it cushions the soil a little bit, whatnot. But when God decides to flood the earth, he caused an earthquake. And this earthquake ends up causing the crust to crack in the earth where the water shoots up. But those cracks end up becoming the tectonic plates that we see today in our crust of the earth. Before, those plates were not there. Now they are. And everything, and that's why you still have volcanoes and earthquakes and stuff today, because those plates are either pulling apart, pushing into each other, rubbing against each other, causing issues there. So this earthquake causes these cracks in the crust to form, again making the tectonic plates we have today. And as the water shot up, it began to erode the dirt and rock around it, forming mudslides that covered many plants and animals. And if you had a global flood, you expect to find millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth. And guess what you find? You find millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth. And, everything. and we have what we call the Cambrian explosion, where you have just all of a sudden you have all the animals that have ever lived that you see today and stuff all right there. In fact, if you actually look at the geological column that the scientists have, you just compare it to a football field. You go from one end zone to about the 90-yard line, and you have pretty much nothing. Then all of a sudden, the last 10 yards, you have everything. If evolution actually was true, you think you'd have a little staggered out a little bit more so in a lot of that area. So again, the mudslides and stuff cover the animals very rapidly, which is why you end up getting fossils. Both plants and animals get fossilized through this. And you actually also have fossilized trees that are standing straight up through various layers which shows these layers had to happen quickly, not over millions of years. So the water that was in the uppermost parts of the atmosphere would eventually turn into snow, ice, and rain. So at first it was coming down as rain, but it, was it would still stay up there. If it shot really, really high, it would get really cold, and eventually comes back down as ice or snow on top of the rain and everything there. So the rain will fall for 40 days, 40 nights, but after that, then the, once the water gets too high for the geyser to shoot up out of the water, the water just starts rising again. The Bible says it rose for another 150 days after the flood started. So you have five months where the water is rising up out of the ground and covering the earth. That's more than enough time to do it. Everybody wants to focus on the 40 days of rain which is not enough to flood the entire earth, even if it's mostly flat to that degree. But if there's water shooting out of the ground for five months, think that's long enough to flood the entire planet? Mm. 22 feet in the air? Yeah, I'd say so. So, again, as we said, the rain lasted 40 days, 40 nights, and the water continued to shoot out of the ground for 150 days, as I mentioned a while ago. So the flood ends up destroying a whole lot of things. It destroys quite a bit of stuff on the planet. And my notes all got cattywonkus here. Give me one moment. Oh, wow. Okay. All right, so what caused, so God ends up causing the land to rise and fall as well. So after the flood, God ends up causing land to appear. How does this happen? Well, God ends up causing the mountains to rise up and valleys to get the runoff of the water. And we actually see this in Scripture as well where it talks about God doing these things. Psalm 104, verses 5 through 7. Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever? Thou coverest it with the deep as with a garment. So talking about the flood. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At thy voice, thy th or at, sorry, at thy voice of thy thunder they hasted away. So again, it's talking about the flood, right? So it had all this water, but as soon as God commanded it, what? The water went off of the earth. And looking at verses 8 and 9, They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, 
that they turn not again to cover the earth. So what happened? Again, God caused mountains to form, rise up. He caused valleys to go down. They would end up giving a place for the water to go and for dry land to appear. Do you think that's going to cause a lot of craziness going on on the planet as that's happening? A lot of shaking, a lot of rumbling, a lot of volcanic activity. Yeah, it's not just magically going to do it without any consequences, right? There's going to be real-life consequences to these changes happening. And if we look at the earth today, again, we have all these tectonic plates all over the place and these cracks in the earth. And so how did dry land appear? Well, again, God ended up using the earth to do this. And so dry land would end up appearing through volcanic activity. Volcanoes ended up forming around the tectonic plates and most mountain ranges on the earth are actually dormant volcanoes the rocky mountains are all volcanic and you actually have what is called the ring of fire around the pacific ocean and stuff that has a lot of volcano activity uh, japan was created by a volcano mount fuji and you also have a lot of south south american mountains again are all volcanic central america still has many active volcanoes in its mountainous area there. So, again, you have many, many areas that were created by volcanoes. And can volcanoes create land very quickly? Yeah. Yeah, look, at, look at what happened in Mount St. Helens. Yeah. They created thousands of layers in just a matter of a few days. <laughs> and you also have vegetation growing out of it within just a matter of months of after it cooled off. So, yeah, volcanoes are good at making land. So, you know, the way this works, you have either the land pulling apart and the lava shooting up and everything, or you have subjection where it goes down and then sh and ends up creating a cone or whatnot there. But you also have mountains that kind of collide together. The Himalayas were actually made by uh, the tectonic plates actually colliding again to each other. As some of the tectonic plates are pulling apart so volcanoes can form, others have to be hitting each other. And so in the Himalayas, that's the where those mountains come from, they're actually, the plates have smashed into each other and just kept building and building and building the rock and the dirt up as it continued to smash and crash into each other. So you have mountains forming, again, to help make the dry land. And again, you naturally end up having dips and stuff going into the crust as well. On, land, on dry land, the, crust, the thickness of the crust is a few miles thick. But if you go to the oceans, it's actually a lot less. So again, it's several miles thick on the earth where we're at, but it's actually a lot thinner in the oceans. So God ends up moving the dirt around to pile it up to where it can be above the water and makes it low enough in other areas where the water could run off. But God also made the water cycle. The Bible says that he caused an east wind or a wind to start blowing across the earth and that would help to evaporate some of the water and so some of the water that was on the earth are now in the clouds as well above the earth. And as I flew back from Mexico I got a whole bunch of good pictures of different layers of clouds and stuff from the airplane. It was actually really cool to see all that. And so where did all the water for the flood go? It's still in the oceans. It's in the sky and the clouds. We see it all around us. And it's crazy that evolutionists and secularists, atheists and stuff, try to argue well, there's never a global flood on the earth when 70% of the earth's surface is covered by water. But Mars, that has no water, they claim that one time, way back in the day it had a global flood. Because there's certain th aspects in the rocks that could only be made by water, so they had to have a global flood there. But there was never a global flood on a planet that's covered by 70% of water. But there is one that has no water whatsoever, but it had a flood at some point. So again, the world was a lot warmer before the flood. And that ends up allowing for, again, the dinosaurs to survive very well pre-flood. Yesterday we did look at the fact that there were dinosaurs on the ark. So they get off the ark and they are able to survive pretty well for a little bit. Again, reptiles always do better in warmer climates. 
Yeah, we know that because we see that today, right? A lot of, our, a lot of reptiles and stuff where they're mostly, you know, have a whole bunch of them, they're usually warmer. Alligators and crocodiles are usually further south, right, into the tropical regions. We do have snakes around here, but again, once it turns cold, you don't see them for a while, right, until it starts warming back up. So again, they do tend to want to be in more tropical areas, and the dinosaurs would have been the same thing. The crazy thing is that after the flood and after Noah gets off the ark and everything, all that volcanic activity and all these changes and stuff would have caused an ice age. Yes, ice age is real, but it's not nearly as long nor as many as evolutionists like to try to claim. So it would have caused an ice age to form. And so the dinosaurs, if they are too far north or too far south, they would end up dying out. They had to stay about where the equator is in order to continue to live and to thrive. And if you look at where most of the dragon legends are from, what? It's kind of around that tropical region for the most part. Some of the smaller ones might be able to survive further north, but the big ones definitely have to stay further toward the center of the earth in the equator. So why did the dinosaurs die out? Well, again, the change of the weather where it's cooler than what it used to be when God made the earth, that has something to do with it. They're just not able to survive. But also human activity would be a big problem for them as well because people, we like killing things and we like killing animals. And so we actually hunted and killed a lot of dinosaurs. So again, many dinosaurs were hunted by people. For various reasons. One thing would be food. If you're hungry and you have this big old beast roaming around destroying stuff and everything, guess what? If you and about 50 other people attack it, then you could be eating for a month or better off of, off of a sauropod. You wouldn't have to worry about food for quite a while. So you have brontosaurus steak, T Rex ribs, you know, remember on a uh, Flintstones, right? They put that big old rib on his car and flipped it over, right? And so, again, so you have the huge ribs and stuff. So you have a lot to eat there with food. People also like hunting for sport. And I imagine a lot of the dinosaurs and stuff were killed for sport. They like hunting for the sake of killing things. The American buffalo was just about wiped out because people just wanted to kill them for the sake of killing them. It was so bad, they actually were shooting them from trains as they were going by the herds and stuff. And I tell the kids, they're like, they were shooting guns out of a train? Yes, it was wild times in the 1800s. But yeah. So another reason why they'd be killed would be for protection. Because if you have something like this, or similar to it, that is going through and killing people, and this and that, you'd want to kill it before it kills you, Right? And so it would be there for protection and make sure that you protect yourself and your families and towns. Also, if, they, if there were the ones that are considered to be fire breathing, having some type of chemical reaction that would cause burning and stuff like that, or venomous, then of course you definitely would not want them around either. Right? You want to get rid of them as well. And also, people kill dinosaurs for gaining social status. We've all heard, you know, European tales of, you know, how does a knight in it, or a person get knighthood? You kill a dragon, right? You become a knight. So you can gain social status and nobility by killing some of these great beasts that are terrorizing the area around there. So who's to say, again, that these things did not happen again in real life, again, since dragon is the old word for dinosaur. And it does not take long for animals to go extinct. A lot of evolutionists will argue, well, you think dinosaurs went extinct in just a few, about 4,000 years? You know, they lived millions of years ago. It took them millions of years to go extinct. Really? It doesn't take that long for animals to go extinct. Because all they have to do is simply just die quicker than they can produce. And here's a big list of extinct animals and stuff. Now, I do have to laugh that they put the dodo on there because the dodo was actually around whenever Europeans came into Canada and they found it. But it was very rare. They actually finished killing it off and it is now extinct. They put it in extinct ice age animals, even though 
it was around for a little bit. So all these animals right here are have gone extinct in times past, and many of them fairly recently. We have a lot of animals that are on the endangered species lists that were just about wiped out. Again, the American buffalo, the bald eagle, bald eagle, elephants in general because of their tusks for the ivory and whatnot. Again, there's so many things that are animals that are just about extinct. But it's also pretty crazy because they're finding animals they thought that had been extinct for millions of years still alive and finding them in recent times also. So what ended up happening to the dinosaurs? Simple answer is they died, right? And how do they die? Again, the earth today is a lot cooler than it was when God made it because of the flood. And also people going through and doing what people do and killing these massive beasts. Of course, in a way, I'm kind of happy because I would not want to run into Mr. T-Rex here out in an open field. I don't think I'd last too long with having to fight him, so I'm kind of glad he's not around. But some of the other ones would be kind of nice to be around, it, maybe, if they're not aggressive, but, you know. So, yes, God did make the dinosaurs. God did create these wonderful beasts. They were around with man. We have a lot of evidence for these things. Even though the world doesn't want to admit it and they try to discredit you know, a lot of these things, and logic pretty much tells us that it did actually happen. And again, we have to look at these things through God's word, not through what the world is trying to tell us. Why would, why would we want to believe a bunch of lost people about how the earth is when they don't even know what, who God is? We want to, again, we should trust what the Lord has told us and what he has to say and trust his words. So again, let's show people that dinosaurs are, in fact, real, that they are also a part of God's word as well. And so now we have the question and answer session. I don't know if you want to record that or not, but it's whatever you want to do. Huh? Okay, that's fine. So... Moving into the question and answer of I want to know. We're a little early. It's not even 12 yet. We got done with that session pretty quickly. Uh, we might get out of here before 1230. So let's see here what we got. So first question here is what was my favorite Jurassic Park movie? All right, well... My favorite Jurassic Park movie, I would have to probably say, would be the first one. I like the first one, although the second one with the T-Rex running through L.A. was pretty neat, too. By the time you get to the third one, you really st it kind of starts getting a little weird, especially whenever Alan's asleep on the plane. He has a velociraptor look at him and go, Alan! <laughs> and it's just kind of weird. And I know why they did it, but still... Yeah, probably the first and second ones are probably my favorite. I did like the first Jurassic World as well as they kind of rebooted it. But again, the last one was horrible because of all the feather dinosaurs. I was arguing with that thing for so much of the movie, it wasn't even funny. All righty. So, question. If dinosaurs are quote-unquote birds, do they taste like chicken? <laughs> well... And we've shown that dinosaurs are not birds, that they do not turn into birds. And I think that the Matrix just makes everything taste like chicken because they don't know what to make it taste like. So if anybody ever watched the Matrix, you know that joke, right? But um, I have heard people talk about snake and other things. I have eaten alligator, and, and yeah, I mean, a lot of it does taste like ch a reptile does taste like chicken a little bit and everything. So it might have. I don't know. Although the argument could be made that it might be very tough, but from what I understand, just marinate it and soak it in milk and then tenderize it real good, and it might actually be very edible. All righty. So, question, how did the tar pits? How, that's not a complete sentence. So, I guess... Okay, so the tar pits like you find out in California and stuff, so what about them? Well, 
Tar is basically just like very thick petroleum, oil, and whatnot. And so it would have probably formed, again, those pits would have formed after the flood. And they, again, they would not have been prehistoric. Again, a lot of our oil and coal and stuff are actually caused from Noah's flood, or not Noah's flood, God's flood. But, and from that event, the oil come from the remains of highly pressurized dead animals and the coal from pressurized uh, plants and we find these huge oil beds and coal seams all over the planet tar pits would have been about the same thing they would have formed through pressurized animals again the dead carcasses heating up and have, under a lot of pressure and making that oil or tar from there and whether or not that dinosaurs got trapped in tar or whatnot I'm sure it was about whatever got walked in that tar pit without realizing what it was got trapped and sunk and died in there they have found dinosaur fossils in some of the tar pits in california but that does not mean those tar pits are you know prehistoric or you know millions of years old it just means that after the flood a dinosaur wasn't watching where it was going and walked into a tar pit and got stuck and died and everything so yeah the tar pits again they are there and whatnot but again that would have been a precursor to the or not precursor but a result of the flood so here's a good one. Are Komodo dragons, crocodiles, alligators, etc. dinosaurs? The answer would be no. They are not classified as dinosaurs because, remember, when we looked at our classification of dinosaurs, dinosaurs have legs that are underneath them that raises their body off the ground. Komodo dragons, alligators, and crocodiles, as well as the caimans and whatnot, their legs go off to the side. And their bodies are really low. I mean, basically scratching the ground as they walk by and walk along it. So they would not actually fit into that category of dinosaur. Although I remember growing up, several of my teachers said that they are that they were around with the dinosaurs, so they counted them as dinosaurs, but they didn't actually know the correct terms to use for that. But again, yeah. So crocodiles and alligators and stuff—they are not dinosaurs. They are a different type of reptile. That being said, I knew Callie was the one for me when we both realized that we both wanted a Komodo dragon. <laughs> I always said I wanted a Komodo dragon, put it in my front yard and tie it up there. That way nobody would ever bother my house and everything. So, but yeah, Komodo dragons are really cool and whatnot. But yeah, but they are not dinosaurs. They would not be considered dinosaurs based off of the definitions we have. So what was the purpose of, for dinosaurs? Why did God make dinosaurs? And what was the purpose behind them? Well, what's the purpose for anything that God does? I mean, why did God make the platypus? Why did he make a mammal that has the bill of a duck, webbed feet, a beaver's tail, fur, glows in the dark, and is venomous? What's the point behind And lays eggs on top of that, but it's also but it's a mammal because it has mammary glands. Why did he do that? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Again, you got, or you got the walrus. You have these big, huge tusks with cat whiskers and everything, and it's fat like an you know, elephant or whatnot, and it swims around in the water. Why did he make that? I think he just had spare parts left over on day six to start slapping stuff together. I don't know. But as far as dinosaurs go, again, it's really hard to say what the purpose is, but again, but look at behemoth. What did God tell Job? Behold behemoth. And he is a pinnacle of God's creation. He is the top of God's creation. So what? We should be able to look at these creatures and be able to go, man, isn't God awesome? Isn't God really, truly amazing? So what? These animals and all the animals and everything on this planet is what? To bring God glory. So why did God do it? Well, probably the simplest answer is to bring him glory and to show us just how powerful he really is. And again, if we saw one of these things in real life and everything, we're like, yep, God, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was the last one. Yep, that was the last question. No more questions today. All right, so does anybody have anything before we 
Get ready to go. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, the T-Rex would have been actually about the size of what they depicted. I mean, they were probably about 30, 40 feet high in some regards. Uh, you get, just kind of depending where you're at. Because the reason why we know that is because we do have fossils of them, you know, full fossils of their size. So a lot of the bigger ones and stuff that we see, like, again, the sauropods, T-Rex, the triceratops, those are very close to the actual sizes of what they would have been. Of course, we only got the skeleton, so, I mean, you had the skin, the meat, and everything else on top of it. it Maybe just slightly taller. But, again, at the same time, they are roughly the size that they are depicted. Again, velociraptors, like I said, they are about the size of a turkey, which really kind of upsets you. But as I, Sean said earlier, though, it kind of actually makes them a little bit more scary because instead of having just one big one after you have probably 20 turkey-sized velociraptors coming at you all at the same time trying to kill you. And I think that would be a little bit more terrifying than having one about man size coming after me. I might be able to fend off the man size one. I ain't going to fend off 20 turkey-sized velociraptors. This is probably not going to happen. So, yeah, we talked about that one the other day, and the, no, I mean, me and Sean, he was asking me what the name of that one was, and that was like Dilophosaurus, something like that, yeah, something around there, but yeah, th but that would have been bigger than what the raptor, again, the velociraptor would have probably been about yay tall, I mean, it really would have been quite short, the Dilophosaurus, again, would have been this tall, or even, you know, taller, I think some of them even got about 10 feet tall and everything so again they were pretty good sized animals and stuff at the creation museum they have that fossil the allosaurus that we saw a while ago earlier and the allosaurus is quite a bit smaller than the t-rex but it was about 20 feet long so i mean yeah so they were pretty good sized creatures for the most part even though they did start off fairly small coming out of an egg about just yay big right mm. so and of course, the preacher has keeps on having questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. So Loch Ness monster, uh, a lot of depictions are that of a plesiosaur. And a plesiosaur, again, in simple terms, yeah, it looks like a sauropod, but instead of the legs, it has flippers, four flippers that come out. And so, yeah, they look very similar, because it, it wouldn't have the crest up there either. It's a smaller head. Yeah, so it would look similar to this, but again, just a marine reptile where it'd swim around more. And the plesiosaur, like I said, whether or not the Loch Ness Monster is actually there or not, again, there's a lot, been a lot of sightings over the years. And, again, it, look, it sounds like a pleliosaur. It very well could be. And who knows, it might, have, it might have died and that might have been the last one within the last 20 years. That's why no one's, you know, been seeing it. Who knows? But anybody else? My favorite dinosaur? Uh, well, I've always been very fond of the T-Rex, just because he is always considered the king of the dinosaurs. I don't know if he did a good Elvis imperson impersonation or what, but, uh, but I always liked T-Rex. The raptor is always pretty interesting, too, but I like Stegosaurus as well. I like the spikes on his tail, on plates on his back. It's pretty neat. So... I don't know. I don't really have an absolute favorite, I don't guess. I just, I just like them all. They're pretty neat creatures. <laughs>